Yes, the American Civil War was indeed caused by slavery. Even if you attempt to explain away the war using any number of quote alternative causes, the root cause is and always has been slavery. So why do some people claim otherwise? Why is it important to recognize slavery as the cause of the war? And why do all the claimed causes of the Civil War eventually make their way back to slavery? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the first episode in a new, and sometimes weekly series called Unhinged History. In these episodes I find a history take so bad that it kind of makes my blood boil. I then debunk it and talk about why it is harmful or otherwise idiotic. If that's something you enjoy, then definitely consider subscribing and liking the video. It helps tell me that this is the kind of content you want to see. Thanks, and let's get into today's video. The American Civil War is still, to date, the most destructive war in the country's history. While technically the Second World War resulted in more military casualties than the Civil War, overall the Civil War still remains the bloodiest war in American history. To add to that, the war was fought on home soil, and so the infrastructure of nearly half the country was completely destroyed. It's also arguably the most influential war as well. Even today, statues, commemorations, books, and so on dominate the cultural and physical landscape of the country. There are still protests and counter-protests over whether to display prominent Confederate statues and memorials, and just a few miles from where I live, there is a massive Confederate battle flag that still flies on the top of a prominent hill. The point I'm making here is that even today, over 150 years later, the war is still a prominent and at times controversial cultural issue. The take that led to this video came to my attention just over a month ago, when Nikki Haley, a candidate in the Republican presidential primary, claimed that the cause of the Civil War was, quote, basically how government was going to run, the freedoms and what people could and couldn't do, end quote. She later backpedaled and claimed, quote, of course the Civil War was about slavery, end quote, and that her comments were based on what, quote, it means to us today. However, the damage was already done, and political pundits, news networks, armchair political scientists, including yours truly, and so on, rightfully called Nikki Haley out. And frankly, they should have, but we'll get a little bit more into that in just a moment. I first want to start with a bit of an explanation about why I believe comments like this are harmful. Let me preface this by saying that I was born in and grew up in the South. My college degrees are from a Southern school, and I've experienced firsthand some of the issues I'm about to talk about. To start, we first need to talk a little bit about the lost cause of the Confederacy. The lost cause myth is a historical revisionist argument that slavery was not in fact the primary cause, or sometimes even a cause at all in the Civil War. Believers of the lost cause myth stress that the South actually rebelled due to states' rights, or the Southern way of life, or any other theory. Believers of the lost cause exist on a spectrum. The darker side of the myth also treats slavery not as a cruel, unjust, and systematic repression campaign, but instead as a benevolent, civilizing, and even in some cases divine institution. Further, they often claim that American slavery was in some way better or more benevolent than other systems of slavery throughout the world at the time, or even in all of human history. The Lost Cause myth has been circulated basically since the end of the Civil War, with men like Edward A. Pollard and his book, The Lost Cause, A New Southern History of the War of the Confederates, laying down the foundations of the myth. In this book, Pollard actually uses similar language to what we see today. He says states' rights were the main cause of the war, southerners were forced to defend themselves from northern aggression, and of course, the classic of painting slavery as a way of improving the lives of Africans. We still see this kind of sentiment expressed all across the United States today. You need not look too hard to find somebody claiming that slavery brought Africans away from a continent filled with cannibalism and disease, with no civilization, into the glorious, civilized America. It really shouldn't take all that much brain power to recognize just how completely insane such a statement is, and yet, it still to this day is a common refrain among believers in the lost cause. But frankly, I fail to understand how being whipped, being property of another person, having nearly no legal protections, and even those legal protections you do have not really being enforced, living in squalid conditions, and having every aspect of your life controlled by someone else is civilizing, or somehow a good for the slave involved. If you have doubts, just go read accounts by slaves from the time, when they talk about being forced to give up their children as they are sold to another person, or when they talk about being beaten for the simple crime of being sick. How anyone can believe that such conditions were civilizing, or somehow benevolent, is beyond me. 
Further, the common notion of Africa as a backwater, uncivilized continent at the time is simply false. Africa was home to its own vibrant cultures, empires, kingdoms, and peoples. West Africa, where two-thirds of all slaves in North America came from, had been inhabited for millennia. Kingdoms like Mali, Ghana, and many more had all rose and fell long before North America had even been colonized by the Europeans. I know that some lost causers like to point to the slave trade normally beginning with an African state as some sort of trump card that somehow makes the whole process okay. And to be fair, yeah, that is true. It's true that most West African rulers and kingdoms sold slaves to European countries in exchange for various goods. There is no denying that. But I fail to see how that makes American slavery morally just, or even better, just because a person happened to live in a kingdom that was beaten in a war or lived in an undefended village does not mean that they should have been sold into slavery, and further it does not make it a morally just institution. In any case, the lost cause continued to be a prominent theory in the South in the decades following the Civil War. Men like Woodrow Wilson, yes, that Woodrow Wilson, continued to push the theory with films like The Birth of a Nation and the terrible writings of men like Thomas Dixon Jr., who, by the way, once described himself as a quote, professional racist. The Lost Cause myth further spiraled out of control during the Jim Crow era. The Jim Crow era is something that deserves its own series and examinations, but some of the key themes of the period, African Americans being lesser, the concept of a race war, and just a general sense of general racism, were all subsumed, or at least borrowed, by many of the Lost Cause believers of the time. And frankly, it makes a lot of sense. Slavery as an institution had to have some sort of redeeming factor, or some sort of justification, for people as otherwise they were simply being cruel. Today, we still see the effects of the theory in the way the period is taught. For instance, schools in Texas before the 2019 school year were required to teach that slavery was a tertiary cause of the Civil War, with states' rights and sectionalism being the main causes. But this was all just a quick history on the topic, as the video is more meant to discuss the issue in the modern sense, but if you want a deeper dive into the topic, let me know in the comments. Before we talk about the effects of the lost cause and similar theories, we first need to talk about why slavery was the ultimate cause of the Civil War. Prior to the actual start of the war, there had been a growing movement in the north of the country to ban slavery in the whole of the Union. Many states, mostly northern states, but also Kansas, California, and Oregon, had already banned slavery. The South resisted this movement as, quite simply, their entire economy relied on slave labor to function. Frankly, the southern economy would have almost certainly collapsed without slave labor. Add this to the fact that the North's political power was only growing as its population growth was multiple times that of the South, and by even the 1820s, a sense of unease was beginning to permeate the entire nation. The Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1850, and even the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 were all made in an attempt to calm the growing levels of discontent in the South, while also giving some concessions to those in the North who wished for slavery to be banned. I will quickly make a note here, and this is something that a lot of people forget, but not all people in the North wanted slavery banned, just as not all people in the South wanted slavery to continue. However, it was becoming increasingly clear that the nation was divided on the issue by North and South. One of the first real steps towards a civil war came when the Republican Party was formed in 1854. The party was not only almost fully based in the North, but it was also expressly anti-slavery and denounced the institution as a great evil. However, it is important to note here that the party at the time did not call for ending slavery in the South. Instead, they called for it to be contained, and that new states in the Union should not be slave states. Eventually, a man named Abraham Lincoln would become the nominee for the party in the 1860 presidential election. Now, Lincoln personally believed slavery to be morally abhorrent. We see this in his famous speech in Peoria, Illinois, where he admits his own feelings towards slavery, but also admits that he's frankly unsure what can be done about the issue under the current political system. Lincoln, in contrast to the true abolitionists of the time, felt that the country was restrained by the Constitution, which, while not directly condoning slavery or even mentioning the word slave, still granted protections to slave owners through sections such as the Three-Fifths Clause and the Fugitive Slave Clause. In this sense, Lincoln was not an abolitionist, nor did he make promises to abolish the system of slavery in the South. Instead, he was more interested in ensuring that slavery did not spread or extend to new states of the Union. In the end, though, this was simply too much for the southern states. South Carolina kicked off the secession party on December 20th, 1860, with a document announcing their secession from the Union. This document was pretty basic. 
and basically was just a notification that South Carolina was leaving the Union and becoming an independent nation. The more in-depth document came a few days later on December 24th. This document, formerly known as the Declaration of the Immediate Causes which Induce and Justify the Secession of South Carolina from the Federal Union, laid out why South Carolina was leaving the Union. Any guesses as to why? Well, to quote the document itself, quote, an increasing hostility on the part of the non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery." End quote. Following South Carolina, ten more states would declare the secession from the Union. Three of them, Texas, Alabama, and Virginia, would expressly state in their secession documents that it was the plight of the quote, slaveholding states at the hands of the North that caused their secession. Texas, Mississippi, and Georgia would follow the lead of South Carolina and put forward more explanations for their secessions shortly after their declarations. All four states laid the blame for the secession on the movement to abolish slavery. We can also look at statements both during and after the war. John S. Mosby, a Confederate commander, wrote that after the war, he had, quote, never heard of any other cause than slavery. A paper in Richmond further stated, quote, the people of the South, says a contemporary, are not fighting for slavery but for independence. Let us look into this matter. It is an easy task, we think, to show up this newfangled heresy. A heresy calculated to do us no good, for it cannot deceive foreign statesmen nor peoples, nor mislead anyone here nor in Yankee land. Our doctrine is this. We are fighting for independence that our great and necessary domestic institution of slavery shall be preserved, and for the preservation of other institutions of which slavery is the groundwork." End quote. Mississippi Senator John Sharp Williams stated in 1904, quote, Local self-government temporarily destroyed may be recovered and ultimately retained. The other thing for which we fought is so complex in its composition, so delicate in its breath, so incomparable in its symmetry, that being once destroyed, it is forever destroyed. This other thing for which we fought was the supremacy of the white man's civilization in the country, which he proudly claimed his own, in the land which the Lord his God had given him founded upon the white man's code of ethics and sympathy with the white man's tradition and ideals. And frankly, I can go on and on, but I think it's pretty clear from those quotes that the Civil War was fought to maintain white dominance and slavery. Of course, the hit back here is that the war was actually about secession or states' rights. The issue here is that even if you accept that the war was about secession, or even states' rights, you have to ask the question of, well, why? Why was secession or states' rights the cause of the war? And the answer is frankly slavery. If you look at the secession issue, you have to ask why did the states even want to secede? And the answer is in the secession documents. Remember that quote in South Carolina's explanation? An increasing hostility on the part of the non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery? There is your answer. If you want to talk about states' rights, well, what were the states' rights at issue? Most say that it was a fight over the rights of individual states to fight or nullify laws passed by the federal government. Well, what were the laws that the southern states were fighting against? Oh, that's right, the refusal of northern states to enforce the fugitive slave laws. Notice how in the end it all comes back to slavery? That is the key sticking point here. Even if you decide that you don't want to believe that slavery was the cause of the Civil War, any other thing you decide to pick almost certainly has its roots in the slavery debate. War starting over secession. Secession was only in question because of the issue of slavery. Or starting over states' rights. Again, the right in question was the keeping of slaves and the return of fugitive slaves. War starting over social or economic differences. Those differences have their root in slavery. War starting over the political differences. Those political differences were about slavery. War over sectionalism. Sectionalism existed because of slavery. War started over the Southern way of life. That way of life was directly supported by slavery. And frankly, I can go on and on. The point, though, is that even if you ignore slavery as the key and main cause of the war, just about anything you decide to say is the main or key cause of the war has its roots in slavery. I will note here something that a lot of people forget. This does not mean that the North was full of abolitionists or anti-racist or something like that. The North was just as racist and just as likely to prosecute and discriminate against black people as the South. I will also leave some links and resources about both the causes of the Civil War and the Lost Cause myth in the description. I will also note here that I think there is a difference between remembering the Confederate soldiers who died and celebrating or honoring the Confederacy and its ideals. It's frankly only natural to want to recognize your ancestors. Hell, 
I myself have ancestors who fought on the side of the Confederates. But I do think it is important to realize just why the Confederates were fighting, even when you honor or think about those who died. So why do I think the Lost Cause myth is dangerous? Well, first of all, the myth explicitly justifies slavery in the Civil War, both of which were, and still are, stains on American history. Not only does justifying slavery downplay the horrible conditions, treatment, and systematic oppression that slaves and even the descendants of slaves had to face, it also promotes an explicitly racist viewpoint that the slave owners in the South were somehow improving the lives of their slaves, when in actuality, they were oppressing, abusing, and profiting off that abuse and oppression. Secondly, the Lost Cause myth stops Americans from recognizing the evils that were carried out by our earlier governments. The proper response to having these horrible institutions and conditions in our history is not to try to explain them away or to blame some other issue. The proper response is to look back and say, yes, this happened, but we are better now. We no longer believe that slavery was a benevolent institution. Instead, it was a racist, oppressive, and aggressive institution that not only resulted in the death and oppression of millions of contemporary slaves, but even still to this day affects the lives and livelihoods of millions of people. At its core, the Civil War was a war over slavery. The vehicle of that issue, be it states' rights, secession, or economic issues, is also at its core an issue over slavery. It's important to recognize that fact, and to realize that the way to respond to history is not to try and explain it away with less controversial or less offensive causes, but to confront head-on the deficiencies and issues that we caused in our history. The Lost Cause myth is a dangerous ideology that blocks us from recognizing the horrible things that actually happened in our history. What people like Nikki Haley and others who express belief in the Lost Cause are doing, either consciously or not, is minimizing the impact of slavery, while feeding the flames for those who attempt to justify the institution. At its core, the Civil War was a war over slavery. The vehicle of that issue, be it states' rights, secession, or economic issues, is also at its core an issue over slavery. It is important to recognize that fact, and to realize that the way to respond to history is not to try and explain it away with less controversial or less offensive causes, but to confront head-on the deficiencies and issues that caused our history, lest we repeat them again. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. I hope to make this a new series on the channel where I look at what I believe is a bad historical take and talk about why. You can probably see this video was supposed to come out a month ago, but sadly I was a bit too sick to record it, and so here we are. Also, if anyone who has made it this far still believes in the Lost Cause myth, be respectful in the comments, or you'll just be hidden from the channel. Anyway, if you have any comments or questions on the video or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below, and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed, it really helps the channel out. Peace!